Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of Siege and Storm by Lee Bardugo. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so that you'll be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support BBC, you can do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. One, you can become a patron and support us on a regular basis, or two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. This series is made possible by Caitlin Cadell, who did just that and sent us this novel. So without further ado, let us continue. Siege and Storm, Chapter 2 Darkness again. Something seething inside of me. I look for the light, but it's out of my reach. Drink. I open my eyes. Ivan's scowling face comes into focus. You do it, he grumbles to someone. Then Jinya leans over me, more beautiful than ever, even in a beraggled red kefta. Am I dreaming? She presses something against my lips. Drink, Alina. I try to knock the cup away, but I can't move my hands. My nose is pinched shut, my mouth forced open. Some kind of broth slides down my throat. I cough and sputter. Where am I? I try to say. Another voice, cold and pure. Put her back under. I am in the pony cart, riding back from the village with Anna Kuya. Her bony elbow jabs into my rib as we jounce up the road that will take us home to Karamzin. Mal is on her other side, laughing and pointing at everything we see. The fat little pony plods along, twitching its shaggy mane as we climb the last hill. Halfway up, we pass a man and a woman on the side of the road. He is whistling as they go, waving his walking stick in time with the music. The woman trudges along, head bent, a block of salt strapped to her back. Are they very poor? I ask Anakuya. Not so poor as others. Then why doesn't he buy a donkey? He doesn't need a donkey, says Anna Cunha. He has a wife. I'm going to marry Alina, Mal says. The cart rolls past. The man doffs his cap and calls a jolly greeting. Mal shouts back gleefully, waving and smiling, nearly bouncing from his seat. I look back over my shoulder, craning my neck to watch the woman slogging along behind her husband. She's just a girl, really, but her eyes are old and worn. Anna Kuya misses nothing. That's what happens to peasant girls who do not have the benefit of the Duke's kindness. That's why you must be grateful and keep him every night in your prayers. The clink of chains. Jinya's worried face. It isn't safe to keep doing this to her. Don't tell me how to do my job, Ivan snaps. The darkling in black standing in the shadows. The rhythm of the sea beneath me. The realization hits me like a blow. We're on a ship. Please let me be dreaming. I'm on the road, in Karim Zen again, watching the pony's bent neck as he labors up the hill. When I look back, the girl struggling beneath the weight of the salt block has my face. Bagra sits beside me in the cart. The ox fills the yoke, she says, but does the bird feel the weight of its wings? Her eyes are black jet. Be grateful, they say. Be grateful. She snaps the reins. Drink. More broth. I don't fight it now. I don't want to choke again. I fall back, let my lids drop, drifting away, too weak to struggle. A hand on my cheek. Mal, I manage to croak. The hand is withdrawn. Nothingness. Wake up. This time I don't recognize the voice. Bring her out of it. My lids flutter open. Am I still dreaming? A boy leans over me. Ruddy hair, a broken nose. He reminds me of the too clever fox. Another of Anna Kuya's stories. Smart enough to get out of one trap, but too foolish to realize he won't escape a second. There's another boy standing beside, behind him. But this one is a giant. One of the largest people I've ever seen. His golden eyes have the shoe tilt... Alina, says the fox. How does he know my name? The door opens and I see another stranger's face. A girl with short, dark hair 
in the same golden gaze as the giant. They're coming, she says. The fox curses. Put her back down. The giant comes closer. Darkness bleeds back in. No, please. It's too late. The dark has me. I am a girl, trudging up a hill. My boots squelch in the mud and my back aches from the weight of the salt upon it. When I think I cannot take another step, I feel myself lifted off the ground. The salt slips from my shoulders and I watch it shatter on the road. I float higher, higher. Below me I can see a pony cart and three passengers looking up at me, their mouths open in surprise. I can see my shadow pass over them, pass over the road and the barren winter fields, the black shape of a girl, borne high by her own unfurling wings. The first thing I knew was real was the rocking of the ship, the creak of the rigging, the slap of the water on the hull. When I tried to turn over, a shard of pain sliced through my shoulder. I gasped and jolted upright, my eyes flying open, heart racing, fully awake. A wave of nausea rolled through me and I had to blink back the tears, the stars that floated across my vision. I was in a tidy ship's cabin lying on a narrow bunk. Daylight spilled through the side scuttle. Jinya sat on the edge of my bed, so I hadn't dreamed her. Or was I dreaming now? I tried to shake the cobwebs from my mind, and I was rewarded with another surge of nausea. The unpleasant smell of the in the air wasn't helping to settle my stomach. I forced myself to take a long, shaky breath. Jinya wore a red kefta, embroidered in blue a combination I'd never seen on any other Grisha. The garment was dirty and a bit worn, but her hair was arranged in flawless curls, and she looked more lovely than any queen. She held a tin cup to my lips. Drink, she said. What is it? I asked warily. Just water. I tried to take the cup from her and realized my wrists were in irons. I lifted my hands awkwardly. The water had a flat metallic tang, but it, I was parched. I sipped, coughed, then drank greedily. Slowly, she said, her hands smoothing the hair back from my face, or you'll make yourself sick. How long? I asked, glancing at Ivan, who leaned against the door watching me. How long have I been out? A little over a week, Jinya said. A week? Panic seized me. A week of Ivan slowing my heart rate to keep me unconscious. I shoved to my feet and blood rushed to my head. I would have fallen if Jinya hadn't reached out to steady me. I willed, I willed the dizziness away, shook her off, then stumbled to the side scuttle and peered through the foggy circle of glass. Nothing. Nothing but blue sea. No harbor. No coast. Nyovi Zim was long gone. I fought the tears that rose behind my eyes. Where's Mal? I asked. When no one answered, I turned around. Where's Mal? I demanded to, of Ivan. The Darkling wants to see you, he said. Are you strong enough to walk or do I have to carry you? Give her a minute, said Jinya. Let her eat. Wash her face at least. No, take me to him. Jinya frowned. I'm fine, I insisted. Actually, I felt weak and woozy and terrified, but I wasn't about to lie back down on that bunk, and I needed answers, not food. As we left the cabin, we were engulfed in a wall of stench. Not the usual ship smells of bilge and fish and bodies that I remembered from our voyage aboard the Verhader, but something far worse. I gagged and clamped my mouth shut. I was suddenly glad I hadn't eaten. What is that? Blood? Bone, rendered blubber, said Ivan. We were aboard a whaler. You get used to it, he said. You get used to it, retorted Jinya, wrinkling her nose. They brought me to a hatch that led to the deck above. Ivan clambered up the ladder and I scrambled hastily after him, eager to be out of the dark bowels of the ship and free of that rotting stench. It was hard climbing with my hands and irons, and Ivan quickly lost patience. He hooked my wrist to haul me up the last few feet. I took in great gulps of cold air and blinked in the bright light. The whaler was lumbering along at full sail, driven forward by three Grisha squallers, 
who stood by the mast with arms raised, their blue kefta flapping around their legs. Ethereal Key, the Order of Summoners. Just a few short months ago, I'd been one of them. The ship's crew wore, wore rough spun, and many were barefoot. The better to grip the ship's slippery deck. No uniforms, I noted. So they weren't military, and the ship flew no colors that I could see. The rest of the Darklings, Grisha, were easy to pick up, pick out among the crew, not just because of their brightly colored kefta, but because they stood idly by the railings, gazing out at the sea or talking while the regular sailors worked. I even saw a fabric fabricator in her purple, purple kefta propping up against a coil of rope, reading. As we passed by two massive cast iron kettles set into the deck, I got a fierce whiff of the stink that had been so powerful below. The tripods, Jinya said, where they render the oil. They haven't been used on this voyage, but the smell never fades. Grisha and the crewmen alike turned to stare as we walked the length of the ship. When we passed beneath the mizzenmast, I looked up and saw the dark-haired boy and girl from my dream perched high above us. They hung from the rigging like two birds of prey, watching us with matching golden eyes. So it hadn't been a dream at all. They'd been in my cabin. Ivan led me to the prow of the ship, where the darkling was waiting. He stood with his back to us, staring out over the bowsprit to the blue horizon below, his black kefta billowing around him like an inky banner of war. Jinya and Ivan made their bows and left us. "'Where's Mal?' I rasped, my throat still rusty. The Darkling didn't turn, but shook his head and said, "'You're predictable, at least.' "'Sorry to bore you. Where is he?' "'How do you know he isn't dead?' My stomach lurched. "'Because I know you,' I said with more confidence than I felt. "'And if he were, would you throw yourself into the sea?' "'Not unless I could take you with me. Where is he?' "'Look behind you.' I whirled. Far down the stretch of the main deck, through the tangle of rope and rigging, I saw Mal. He was flanked by Corporal Keith. Guards, but his focus was trained on me. He'd been watching, waiting for me to turn. I stepped forward. The Darkling seized my arm. No farther, he said. Let me talk to him, I begged. I hated the desperation in my voice. Not a chance. You two have a bad habit of acting like fools and calling it heroic. The Darkling lifted my hand, and Mal's guards started to, to lead him away. Alina, he yelled, and then grunted as a guard cuffed him hard across the face. Mal, I shouted as they dragged him, struggling below deck. Mal! I flinched out of the Darkling's grip, my throat choked with rage. If you hurt him... I'm not going to hurt him, he said. At least not while he can be of some use to me. I don't want him harmed. He's safe for now, Alina, but don't test me. If one of your... One of you steps out of line, the other will suffer. I've told him the same. I shut my eyes, trying to push back the fury and hopelessness that I felt. You were, We were right back where we'd started. I nodded once. Again, the Darkling shook his head. You two make it so easy. I prick him, you bleed. And you can't begin to understand that, can you? He reached out and tapped Morozova's collar letting his fingers graze the skin of my throat. Even that faint touch opened the connection between us, and a rush of power vibrated through me like a bell being struck. I understand enough. I want to see him, I managed. Every day I want to know he's safe. Of course, I'm not cruel, Alina, just cautious. I almost laughed. Is that why you had one of your monsters bite me? That's not why, he said, his gaze steady. He glanced at my shoulder. Does it hurt? No, I lied. The barest hint of a smile touched his lips. It will get better, he said, but the wound can never be fully healed, not even by Grisha. Those creatures, the Nietzsche Voya. 
Nothings. I shuddered, remembering the skittering, clicking sounds that they'd made. The gaping holes of their mouths. My shoulder throbbed. What are they? His lips tilted. The faint tracery of scars on his face was barely visible, like the ghost of a map. One ran perilously close to his right eye. He'd almost lost it. He cupped my cheek with his hand, and when he spoke, his voice was almost tender. They're just the beginning. He left me standing on the foredeck, my skin still alive with the touch of his fingers, my head swimming with questions. Before I could begin to sort through them, Ivan appeared and began yanking me back across the main deck. Slow down, I protested, but he just gave another jerk on my sleeve. I lost my footing and pitched forward. My knees banged painfully into the deck, and I barely had time to put up my shackled palms to break my fall. I winced as a splinter dug into my flesh. Move, Ivan ordered. I struggled to my knees. He nudged me with the toe of his boot, and my knee slipped out from beneath me, sending me back down the deck with a loud thud. I said move! Then the large hand scooped me up and gently set me on my feet. When I turned, I was surprised to see the giant and the dark-haired girl. Are you all right? she asked. This is none of your concern, Ivan said angrily. She's Sturmhan's prisoner, replied the girl. She should be treated accordingly. Sturmhand? The name was familiar. Was this his ship, then? And his crew? There'd been talk of him aboard the Verhader. He was a Ravkin privateer and smuggler, infamous for breaking the Fjordan blockade and for the fortune he'd made capturing enemy ships. But he wasn't flying the double eagle flag. She's the Darkling's prisoner, said Ivan, and a traitor. Maybe on land, the girl shot back. Ivan gabbled something in Shu that I didn't understand. The giant just laughed. You speak Shu like a tourist, he said. And we don't take orders from you in any language, the girl added. Ivan smirked. Don't you? His hand twitched and the girl grabbed at her chest, buckling to one knee. Before I could blink, the giant had a wickedly curved blade in his hand and was lunging at Ivan. Lazily, Ivan flicked the other hand out and the giant grimaced. Still, he kept coming. Leave them alone, I protested, tugging helplessly at my irons. I could summon light with my wrist bound, but I had no way to focus it. Ivan ignored me. His hand tightened into a fist. The giant stopped in its tracks and the sword fell from his fingers. Sweat broke out on his brow as Ivan squeezed the life from his heart. Let's not get out of line, you zo. Ivan chided. You're killing him, I said, panic now. I ran my shoulder into Ivan's side, trying to knock him down. At that moment, a loud double click sounded. Ivan froze, his smirk evaporating. Behind him stood a tall boy around my age, maybe a few years older. Ruddy hair, a broken nose. The too clever fox. He had a cocked pistol in his hand, a barrel pressed against Ivan's neck. I'm a gracious host, bloodletter. But every house has rules. Host? So this must be Sturmhand. He looked too young to be a captain of anything. Ivan dropped his hands. The giant sucked in air. The girl rose to her feet, still clutching her chest. They were both breathing hard and their eyes burned with hate. That's a good fellow, Sturmhand said to Ivan. Now I'll take the prisoner back to her quarters and you can run off and do whatever it is you do when everyone else is working. Ivan scowled. I don't think. Clearly. Why start now? Ivan's face flushed in anger. You don't! Sturmhan leaned in close, the laughter gone from his voice, his easy demeanor replaced by something with a sword's edge. I don't care who you are on land. On this ship, you're nothing but ballast. Unless I put you over the side, in which case you're shark bait. I like shark. Cooks up tough, but it makes for a little variety. Remember that the next time you have a mind to threaten anyone aboard this vessel. He stepped back, his jolly manner restored. Go on now, shark bait. Scurry back to your master. I won't forget this, Sturmhand, Ivan spat. The captain rolled his eyes. That's the idea. Ivan turned on his heel and stomped off. Sturmhan holstered his weapon and smiled pleasantly. 
Amazing how quickly a ship feels crowded, no? He reached out and gave the giant and the girl each a pat on the shoulder. You did well, he said quietly. Their attention was still on Ivan. The girl's fists were clenched. I don't want trouble, the captain warned. Understood? They exchanged a glance, then nodded grudgingly. Good, said Sturmhand. Get back to work. I'll take her below decks. They nodded again. Then, to my surprise, they each sketched a quick bow to me before they departed. Are they related? I asked, watching them go. Twins, he said. Tolia and Tamar. And you're Sturmhand. On my good days, he replied. He wore leather breeches, a brace of pistol at his hip, and a bright teal frock coat with gaudy gold buttons and enormous cuffs. It belonged in a ballroom or on an opera stage, not on the deck of a ship. What's a pirate doing on a whaler? I asked. Privateer, he corrected. I have several ships. The Darkling one wanted a whaler, so I got him one. You mean you stole it? Acquired it. You were in my cabin. Many women dream of me, he said lightly as he steered me down the deck. I saw you when I woke up, I insisted. I need... He held up a hand. Don't waste your breath, lovely. But you don't even know what I was going to say. You are about to plead your case, tell me that you need my help, you can't pay me, but your heart is true, the usual thing. I blinked. That was exactly what I'd been about to do. But... Waste of breath, waste of time, waste of a fine afternoon, he said. I don't like to see prisoners mistreated, but that's as far as my interest goes. You, he shook his head, and I'm notoriously immune to tales of woe, so unless your story involves a talking dog, I don't want to hear it. Does it? Does it what? Involve a talking dog. No, I snapped. It involves the future of a kingdom and everyone in it. A pity, he said, and took me by the arm, leading me to the aft hatch. I thought you worked for Ravka, I said angrily. I worked for the fattest purse. So you'd sell your country to the Darkling for a little gold? No, for a lot of gold, he said. I assure you, I don't come cheap, he gestured to the hatch. After you. With Sturmhan's help, I made it back down to my cabin, where two Grisha guards were waiting to lock me inside. The captain bowed and left me without another word. I sat down on my bunk, resting my head in my hands. Sturmhan could play the fool all he wanted. I knew he'd been in my cabin and there had been a reason. Or maybe I was just grasping at a little bit of hope. When Jinya brought me my dinner tray, she found me curled up in my bunk, facing the wall. You should eat, she said. Leave me alone. Sulking gives you wrinkles. Well, lying gives you warts, I said sourly. She laughed, then entered and, s and set down the tray. She crossed to the side scuttle and glanced at her reflection in the glass. Maybe I should go blonde, she said. Corporal Key Red clashes horribly with my hair. I cast a glance over my shoulder. You know you could wear baked mud and outshine every girl on two continents. True, she said with a grin. I didn't return her smile. She sighed and studied the toes of her boots. I missed you, she said. I was surprised at how much those words hurt. I'd missed her too, and I'd felt like a fool for it. Were you ever my friend? I asked. She sat down at the edge of the bunk. Would it make a difference? I like to know just how stupid I've been. I loved being your friend, Alina but I'm not sorry for what I did. And what the Darkling did? Are you sorry for that? I know you think he's a monster, but he's trying to do what's right for Ravka, for all of us. I shoved up to my elbows. I would lived with the knowledge of the Darkling's lies so long that it was easy to forget how few people knew what he really was. Jinya, he created the fold. The black heretic. There is no black heretic, I said, revealing the truth that Bagra had laid out before me months ago at the Little Palace. He blamed his ancestor for the fold, but there's only ever been one Darkling, and all he cares about is power. That's impossible. The Darkling has spent his life trying to free Ravka from the fold. How can you say that after what he did to Novokribirsk? 
the Darkling had used the power of the Unsea to destroy an entire town, a show of strength meant to cow his enemies and mark the start of his rule, and I'd made it possible. I know there was an incident. An incident? He killed hundreds of people, maybe thousands. And what about the people on the skiff, she said quietly. I drew in a sharp breath and lay back. For a long moment, I studied the planks above me. I didn't want to ask, but I knew I was going to. The question had haunted me over long weeks and miles of ocean. Were there... were there other survivors? Besides Ivan and the Darkling? I nodded, waiting. Two in Fierney, who helped them escape, she said. A few soldiers from the First Army made it back, and a squalor named Nathalia got out, but she died of her injuries a few days later. I closed my eyes. How many people had been aboard that sand skiff? Thirty? Forty? I felt sick. I could hear the screams, the howls of the Volcra. I could smell the gunpowder and the blood. I'd sacrifice those people for Mal's life, for my freedom, and in the end they died for nothing. We were back in the Darkling's grasp, and he was more powerful than ever. Jenya laid her hand over mine. You did what you had to, Alina. I let out a harsh bark of laughter and yanked my hand away. Is that what the Darkling tells you, Jinya? Does that make it easier? Not really, no. She looked down at her lap, pleading and unpleading the folds of her kefta. He freed me, Alina. What am I supposed to do? Run back to the palace? Back to the king? She gave a fierce shake of her head. No, I made my choice. What about the other Grisha? I asked. They can't all have sided with the Darkling. How many of them stayed in Ravka? Jinya stif stiffened. I don't think I'm supposed to talk about that with you. Jinya, eat, Alina. Try to get some rest. We'll be in the ice soon. The ice. Then we weren't headed back to Ravka. We must be traveling north. She stood up and brushed the dust off of her kefka. She might joke about the color, but I knew how much it meant to her. It proved that she was really a Grisha, protected, favored, a servant no more. I remembered the mysterious illness that had weakened the king just before the Darkling's coup. Jinya had been one of the few Grisha with access to the royal family. She used that access to earn the right to wear red. Jinya, I said as she reached the door, one more question. She paused, her hand on the latch. It seemed so unimportant, so silly to mention after all this time, but it was something that I had bought that had bothered me for a long while. The letters I wrote to Mal back at the little palace. He said he never got them. She didn't turn back to me, but I so I saw her shoulders sag. They were never sent, she whispered. The Darkling said you needed to leave your she closed the door, and I heard the bolt click home. All those hours spent talking and laughing with Jinya, drinking tea and trying on dresses. She'd been lying to me the whole time. The worst part about it, that it was that the Darkling had been right. If I'd kept clinging to Mal and the memory of the love I had for him, I might have never mastered my power. But Jinya didn't know that. She had just followed orders and let my heart break. I didn't know what that was, but it wasn't friendship. I turned onto my side, feeling the gentle roll of the ship beneath me. Was this what it was like to be rocked to sleep in a mother's arms? I couldn't remember. Anna Kuya used to hum sometimes, under her breath, as she went about turning down the lamps and closing up the dormitories in the kermesin for the night. That was the closest Mal and I ever had to had come to a lullaby. Somewhere above, I heard a sailor shout something over the wind. The bell rang to signal the change of watch. We're alive, I reminded myself. We escaped from him before. We can do it again. But it was no good. And finally, I gave in and let the tears come. Sturmhand was bought and paid for. Jinya had chosen the Darkling. Mal and I were alone as we'd always been. Without friends or allies, surrounded by nothing but pitiless sea. This time, even if we escaped, there was nowhere to run.'